Good afternoon and good morning for those uh, of you in different parts of the world. Um, it's just coming up to the top of the hour, so I will start, even though some people are still arriving, as I can see at the moment. Uh, welcome to you all, and thank you for making time to uh, attend this event. In today's webinar, from the IP department to the boardroom, we're going to look at how IP intelligence and data analysis can support commercially focused decision making. I'm Richard Lucas, uh, and I will be chairing this meeting. I work for a company called Streamline IP, and we help IP departments work more efficiently and effectively with the management of their IP. Uh, one of the areas that we help our clients with is elevating the uh, profile of IP in an organization. And one of the ways we do this is to provide exceptional business insights to the board, uh, whether it's understanding competitors' strategy, the landscape that they're entering into a new field, technical field, uh, or new licensing opportunities. Uh, throughout this uh, webinar, I actively encourage questions. Uh, you will find in the uh, window to the right or below, depending on uh, how your uh, browser is set up, uh, a button to uh, to, to chat. Uh, please uh, use that to uh, forward any questions to uh, our panelists, and uh, I'll do my best to, uh, to ensure that they get answered. Um, and we'll have a little question and answer session at the end of uh, for the end 10 minutes or so. Uh, I can see from uh, people arriving on this call, uh, the majority of chief IP officers or general counsel uh, and looking at it, heads of R&D. Um, so we have a wide variety of people as well because they, uh, they also include people from technology and strategic an analytics and patent searches even. So uh, there's no question too great or too small. Please uh, ask away. We're going to hear the different views and uh, from perspectives, uh, motivations and experience of um, two very different organizations. One is a small company, uh, fast growth, uh, that's interested in competitor intelligence. And another is from a large multinational uh, corporation uh, looking at targeting companies to acquire or license IP. So we've got one from the sell side and one from the buy side of the market, if you like to uh, look at it from that perspective. So um, it should be interesting. Now to introduce the panel, um, here we are. Uh, we are very grateful to have two extremely experienced in-house counsel. Uh, the first is Alex Tame and the second is Robin Safai. Uh, Alex is uh, head of licensing and IP management for an Oxford-based company called Oxbotica. He has 17 years experience in IP, nine years with Vodafone, uh, starting out in competitor intelligence and then rose to managing the group IPR function. Uh, he was managing director for IP strategy and valuation specialist, uh, Collar IP, uh, for almost three years. So he's been, he's got a lot of relevant experience and he's been with Oxbotica for just approaching a year. Uh, Oxbotica is one of the world's leading automotive uh, vehicle driving software companies. Uh, it's the first. If this is the first time that you've heard of them, it's because you were. Uh, they were only formed in 2014 as a spin-out from Oxford University. Since then, they've come to meteoric rise uh, uh, in size and now have almost 200 employees. So we are delighted to welcome Alex Tame. Robin uh, Robin Safai is a highly qualified IP attorney currently working in-house with a multinational company called Eaton. Uh, Robin is qualified French and European patent attorney and uh, has undertaken his US patent exams. Uh, he's over 19 years experience in IP, 10 in private practice for three well-known IP firms. And uh, he represented LG for two and a half years. Um, he spent seven years uh, on, focused on licensing before joining Eaton. Uh, his international experience, experience in uh, France, Austria, Hong Kong, and Korea, and he's been at, uh, with Eaton for almost three years. So for those who don't know Eaton, uh, it's a multinational power company uh, that man with over 100,000 employees. Um, Specialisation is quite broad uh, with a range of electrical and industrial sectors, so aerospace, hydraulics, uh, filtration, vehicle, e-mobility. So we're very delighted to welcome Robin Sapai. Finally, on our panel, we're joined uh, by William Mansfield uh, from LexisNexis. LexisNexis have been kind enough to uh, organize this webinar. If you haven't had the chance to check out the patent analytics tool uh, patent site uh, for analyzing patent landscapes, uh, please do so. 
uh, their insight into the uh, huge patent uh, information landscape, million patents, is uh, greatly simplified by some of the neat tools uh, that they have and a very simple user interface. Both our speakers uh, have used LexisNexis uh, patent site tools uh, for analyzing the patent landscape. In terms of timing, I'd like to spend the uh, the, the first 20 minutes uh, speaking with uh, Alex to hear the uh, patents as part of the IP uh, story of a startup, and then 25 minutes with uh, Robin talking about uh, M&A analysis and decision-making in corporates, followed by 10 minutes of questions. With that very rapid introduction, uh, I'd like to uh, hand over to Alex to, uh, to kick the proceedings off. Alex. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. And, and good afternoon or good morning, everybody, wherever you're dialing from. Um, yeah, so just to expand a little bit on the, the background to my world in IP that Richard just shared with you, I've um, spent a lot of time with Vodafone and seen the IP function through the lens of the CTO office, I guess. We used to work through the R&D office. Uh, I'm not actually an attorney. I'm somebody that's an engineer at heart and I've been involved in the world of IP very much from that perspective over the last sort of 15 years or so now. And, and so having moved into the world of sort of more consulting, helping lots of different companies, all shapes and sizes, on finding IP strategies and, and the value of IP, I've got to know quite a lot about different types of companies and how they think about IP, and fundamentally how that discussion around IP starts to be shaped at the boardroom to start getting a bit more traction. And um, if we go to the first slide, Richard, I think one of the things that I've learned through my, my many years in this industry is that the world is changing. And over the last sort of 10 years or so, we've seen a new way of thinking around IP in that it's not really solely just about patents and trademarks, but it's, it's more about intangible assets in organizations. And it's those intangible assets that are driving the value of companies. And if we go to the next slide, for those of you who, who are interested in this topic in more detail, that there was a, a report issued by the UK uh, Patent Office a few years ago now, which kind of brought this whole piece together and looked at the, the value of companies from an intangible point of view, saying that today, 80%, maybe more, of the value of companies is given to its intangible um, assets that it has in its portfolio. And the report goes on to say that those companies that are able to really understand their intangible assets are deemed to be more successful and are seen to be more successful versus the peers in their technical sort of area in their landscape. Companies like us, I'm now with Oxpotica, as Richard said, we're developing software for autonomous vehicles. Our, our business is all about intangible assets and probably our numbers near a 90 percent and so on and so forth. And so what I've come to learn onto the next slide, Richard, is that every company has a range of this sort of hidden value, intangible assets wrapped up in the business. And it's really important to try and look at your own organization and understand which types of intangible assets are driving your value. And this slide and the next one, I've been um, borrowed from my, my previous employer at Collar to, to share with you. But I think it helped sort of extract some of the key areas that we consider to be intangible assets in business and what starts to drive value. And, and it's this sort of language that I found over the years gets more traction when you speak to senior stakeholders, speak to the, the board members or even to potential investors particularly helping a lot of companies with their IP strategy for investment over the years. This sort of language, people find it a bit easier to understand and engage with the IP world. And it keeps the discussion at a level which talks more about the value. My experience has told me that probably most companies have two or three areas that are driving their value. And it's, and it's often not just about the patents. Um, just a quick anecdote, we, we did a, a piece of research audit for a company in the food industry several years ago. And they came to us and said, look, could you, could you help us with our strategy, but particularly the value of the intangible IP that they've got? And we went away and looked at the business. We ran an audit, did some value work on them. And they said, look, we, we think our, our, our valuable assets in the business are our secret recipes that they, they, they define into their food. And we said, well, it, it sort of is, but actually the real components that are driving your value is your contracts 
And did you know that you've got one specific contract that is with a, with a UK supermarket that was underpinning 50% of their annual revenues? And we said that piece of paper is more valuable than probably your secret recipes. And that's a huge risk as well, because it's a 30 day um, termination clause in there from the supermarket. So it gave them a, an area to focus on understanding where the intangible value was and where they should maybe focus some of their resources in trying to to sort of better get a grasp of this, this what is quite a broad area to, to sort of encompass. And for those of you on the call today, maybe, you know, internally to think about what is it that's driving your value? Which components are there for you? For us within Oxpotico, it's all about our people and our software and a lot of the data that we're collecting as well as other bits as well. Next slide, please, Richard. Um, this picture some of you may have seen before, but I think it quite nicely structures the whole world of intangible assets into, into three distinct areas. And, and okay, we can argue the semantics around whether, whether, whether things belong in different boxes or other things to add. But the point being here is that in any organization, you've got a whole range of assets that relate to legal uh, IP, patents, trademarks, um, copyrights, trade secrets, and so on. Um, but then you've got a whole range of assets in the business which are all centered around your people. It's the skills, the knowledge, the processes, the software that they're creating. There's a huge amount of unrecorded and unrecognized invention and innovation that resides in companies as well, which adds significant um, value as well. And actually, particularly for companies like us, all of the or the majority of the value in companies like Oxpotica other small growing companies tends to reside within the people and the technology that those people are, are creating the stuff on the left there the patents trademarks that that's expensive that's a that's a that, that's a that's a rich boys game as i as i often refer to it you need to have money to start, start playing in that field and and it's and we'll come on to that in a moment but often what you find is for smaller companies the focus at the start is the stuff in the middle and then as they grow they start to sort of invest more and more resource time money into developing the legal side patents maybe trademarks and so on and then on the right hand side it's all of the the assets that revolve around your brand your reputation your your route to market and and i and i would probably argue for the big corporates that's where the majority of their value sits within their their customers their reputation and so on and so forth and really what this comes down to is for any company, you can go on to the next slide, Richard. It's can you and how are you developing a balanced portfolio across all of the companies? Because fundamentally what the what the board, what the what your shareholders want to see is all of these assets in a way that is is managed and managed effectively and efficiently and is fit for purpose for the company. And what I've seen over the years of working with many companies is it's those companies that have got a good handle on this are the ones that are deemed to be more successful. Now, if we move on to the next slide, whilst this is all interesting stuff, and I, and I think for those of you on, on the call today, hopefully there's something of interest in what I've just shared with you. One of my frustrations with the IP world is there isn't that much publicly available data that you can start looking at to try and start to understand the IP behavior or IP strategies of companies. Um, and patents are one of the fewly available data points that are made public and, and companies like PatentSite have made fantastic software that pulls all that information together that you can start to harvest and, and go into the detail. But there's a lot of other areas of IP and tangible assets that we can't really see. But I wanted to share with you um, a little case study for a piece of work which we did oh, ages ago now, but kind of looks at a particular tech area and putting some patent data together with a little bit of business um, um, data uh, gives us a bit of an indication of the IP strategies that some companies have been have been exploring. So if we go to the next slide, um, this here is a chart for um, a, a particular tech area, and it's looking at a raft of about 20 or so, 30 companies. And this data is taken from Crunchbase, and it's looking at the date when the companies were founded. So we've looked at a section of companies and we've looked to see when were they founded. And here we can see that there are some early players that were founded back in the mid 2000s. You then see a ramp up of companies sort of in the 2015, 2016, and then a couple more, more recently. And so I've just taken three of these companies at relative random to look at their patent filing, look at a bit of, a bit of basic investment data to see what their behavior around IP might be able to tell us. And I hope, it, I hope it's a bit interesting some of you so if we go to the first one and this is a company that was 
Um, the data here, by the way, is, is, is take, extracted from the packet site stuff. It's very just looking particularly at the, the those of you more pseudo with the language. This is just priority dates on filings of families. So here we have company one founded back in, in 2013. And then in around sort of mid late 2015, they, they get their seed funding. And what we see is straight after the seed funding has been announced, we can then see that they started to file a few priority patent applications in the months following seed funding. Series A follows quite quickly. And then we can see they've gone up a notch and starting to file a couple more patents a bit more regularly to the point when it turns out this company was acquired back in late 2017. An interesting trend. What's quite fascinating for me is, is because this portfolio is relatively small, you can start to look at some other data around this. And, and I was quite fascinated by the people, the inventors named on the patents in this particular company. And so we had a look, um, a bit of data from LinkedIn and, and using the patent site data to see what have these guys gone and filed? Have they been named on inventions for any other companies since this they required? Or have they been filing for their new company that owned them? And what's quite interesting is from the, I think there was about 15 or so inventors named on this portfolio, not one of them, not one of those inventors has been named on another patent filed for the company that acquired them or in other companies. And you can see where they've moved on from LinkedIn and so on. So this to me strikes me as a company that um, during their early days have kept things very quiet and confidential. They've strategically filed a few bits and pieces and kind of been window dressing them ready for an acquisition. And now they've been acquired. The inventors have disappeared into wherever they've gone now. Quite an interesting approach to IP. Whether I've got it right or not, don't know, but it's certainly for me quite interesting. So if we go to the next one here, same ecosystem, different company, formed around the same time. And you can see here, it's quite soon after their seed round funding was, was announced, um, a whole raft of priority filings got Got, got registered and then they've presumably spent a bit of time on picking that before they've gone through series a and then we see this particular company is regularly filing quite a few priority filing applications every month or two um, quite an expensive portfolio um, they've gone through series b now i have no idea whether that trend has continued and um, this analysis was done ages ago but again very interesting that here's a company that is investing very heavily in building up a portfolio of patented technology um, around its, its business. Compare that to the first company who have just been strategically doing a few, maybe. Um, let's have a look at the third one, because that for me is the most interesting of all of these. Um, another company founded around the same time, they go through seed round funding and nothing. They go through series A and we see no activity. And then they're suddenly acquired. And we can see here, hindsight's a great thing, right? But um, as, as those of you know, patents aren't published for 18 months. At the time this com company was acquired, if we'd have looked at the public records, we wouldn't have been able to see any patents registered to this company name. So lots of question marks about what what, what are the acquirers bought, why, and lots of other questions. So to me, this strikes me as a company that have kept a very solid confidential um, trade secrets, et cetera, et cetera, around their business and only decided to file some patent applications as soon as they started to engage with um, protect their potential acquirer. What's even more interesting from, from, from the data set here is uh, one of the things I, uh, this is my plug for, for you, Will, and PatentSite, but PatentSite has these wonderful competitive indicators that kind of give you a notional view of how impactful patents are. You can look across this data to see whether any particular patents jump out as being more interesting than others. Across these three companies and the data set as a whole, it's one of the patents in this company three data set that is one of the highest rated from the patent site methodology. So to me, that strikes me as a company that have had a very interesting approach to how they've they've kept their IP under wraps around confidentiality and and um, when they've made that decision to 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 register their, their patent applications. Let's just go to the, the next slide and I'll, I'll sort of close out here and hand over to Robin in a second. But here's my kind of observations and takeaways and, and, and hopefully a, a bit of food for thought for those of you on the call who, um, you know, from, from a small company point of view, um, you know, investing in, in any sort of a, a patent portfolio 
it's all about timing and it's about the cost as well. They're really critical. And, and I've worked with so many companies over the past that really grapple with this dilemma. At what point in your journey do you start to invest and how much? And a, and a recognition that often overlooked by many companies, confidentiality, keeping things secret, it's free, it doesn't cost you anything. It costs you time and resources to get the policing right internally. And there is also the risk that other people might go ahead and patent some of your stuff. But it's one strategy that particularly company three there, I think, have adopted over the years. I won't read through the rest of the comments here. Um, you guys can read them at your leisure. But I think I think for me, um, as a small company, it's a real challenge about when and how you start to dive into this area. But I think using some of the stuff that I've spoken about over the course of this little presentation, I hope gives a bit of an indication of the way that I've certainly experienced discussing this with 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 sort of senior stakeholders, boardroom and so on and so forth. And and just one comment at the bottom of this slide, which I think is an interesting one, is whether and at what point you might consider acquiring patents from third parties as opposed to dipping into your R&D to file patent applications. And I say this because um, if I was at a conference last year and the heads of IP from I think it was Uber, Lyft and Facebook were all talking about decisions that they'd made to go out and acquire patent portfolios from third parties in or around their IPOs or wherever to try and boost their IP position and buy them a position, which is why companies like IBM and AT&T and many others are very active in selling portfolios. So there's all there is, you know, if you are engaging in filing a, your own patents and registering stuff, obviously it takes three, four, five years to get them through to granted with cost, et cetera, et cetera. There is an argument or a consideration to be had about whether it's worth looking elsewhere to acquire that if it's already exists in a shape that's suitable for your strategy. And I, and I guess to some extent that kind of links in a little bit to what Robin's going to talk about in a moment about looking at third party IP. But but I I hope that is of interest to some folks on the call and a few snippets of, of thoughts to take away or raise some questions later. Richard, over to you. Thank you, Alex. Um, uh, Alex, you have some interesting experience of small company, uh, large company and uh, consultancy. Um, when do you think is the right time to invest in IP strategy? Investing in a strategy as early as possible in terms of investing in protecting that through patents and some trademarks and so on and other bits that really cost you money. I, I think it just depends. I, I think I think it, it just depends. Each company is so different from the next one. And it depends on what your business strategy is. And it depends on what your end game is going to be. And I think if I look at the three case studies that I've given, they've all had an end game in mind. And I think you can see there, particularly company two, aggressively sort of filing and building a portfolio. Company one, to some extent, company three, not so much. So I think each company is different. And it's it's hard to give a definitive answer to that. But I certainly think for me, developing an IP strategy as early as possible is essential. And, and, and I guess on that note, my thoughts around that are always, when you're developing a strategy, you need to understand yourself, which is predominantly, what have you got? What, what are your key assets? You know, We call it an audit in some parts of the industry, do it yourself or get someone to audit your IP for you. But what's the market look like? Who are your competitors? And what makes them unique and special? And, and then you can start to put those two pieces together to see, well, what is it that makes you unique and special? And I think for me, back to that, that's the slide from Collar with all the little bubbles on it. To me, understanding which IP components are driving your value is really important for small companies because that's where you should be focusing your efforts and your resources in the early days. Thank you. Now, for does, most people on this- that sort of answer the question? It, it does indeed. Fantastic, uh, Alex. Uh, I really appreciate that. I think for most people on this call, they will probably already have an IP strategy in, in place. And so that sort of neatly leads me to to our first question on the uh, the poll, which is, uh, will your board or management team be reevaluating your company's IP strategy um, in this post uh, or in this COVID-19 uh, uh, period? Uh, or are they already doing this? So I was wondering if I can uh, publish this um, uh, poll. Um, for, for those of you on the receiving end, I believe there should be a button in the right or the bottom uh, for polling. And if you could please let us know. So will you be uh, reevaluating your uh, IP strategy? 
can leave that. It's uh, changing all the time at the moment. So I'm just going to get a, uh, a rough litmus test. I'm going to leave that running for a little while. We can come back to it. It's gone from everything from 100% yes to 50% yes, 46. It keeps uh, varying. When it, when it stabilizes out, I will uh, publish that. And it looks like we're getting close. Ooh, the tides are turning. <laughs> so, uh, so it looks like it's now dropping below 40%. So uh, interesting, very interesting. Interesting, the first responders say yes, and the later responders say no. It, yeah. <laughs> Those who say yes, that's a very strong feeling about it. <laughs> a great observation, Will. Um, okay, great, wonderful. Uh, well, with with that little bit of uh, uh, inspiration or uh, joy, then uh, let's um, uh, move on to Robin, uh, Robin Spive, who has some very interesting uh, perspectives from a large multinational. Robin, over to you. Hi, good um, afternoon, good morning to everybody. So my part of this presentation is more focused indeed on the a, a practical case of how I move forward in some real life example. Um, to start with, just a, rem a reminder, because I'm not sure about, you know, in the audience who has full knowledge of that, but those who are familiar with the patent world know already about this, about the amount of data that we have in patents that are available, that are visible for all third party to search and, and dig through it. And it's quite, it's, it's really fantastic, the amount of data that we have there. It's you know, everything from the countries, from the dates, the timeline, the keyword search, the inventors, all this information we can track in so many, many different ways. And it's really at the heart of big data, what we would call big data, but with the advantage of this going back more than 40 years, being available in multiple languages, being so structured that it's a great, great environment for automated translation, which allows us to work in many different languages. So what is, why do I speak about that? Why do I put this in there? And how does that connect with everything else? Well, you know, to start with, and, and what we just were discussing, we certainly shouldn't be waiting to define a strategy and a strategy shouldn't be just like, you know, going along and patenting things as they come. And in today's, you know, case study, we're going to talk about real situation of merger and acquisition. And of course, in a merger and acquisition, when we look at a company as a potential um, acquisition target, we of course do a very extensive due diligence and in all the form of IP that we were discussing, the human side, the customer base, the contract are often what really drives the needle in terms of price point, at least from the point of view of an operating company, which is where I sit today. We're not looking at, you know, seeding uh, ventures. We're not a venture capital when we want to acquire companies because we see an opportunity in a business, but from an established business. And that's what we're trying to acquire. So we look at customer base, we look at contracts, we look at all of those aspects. But if we're looking at a company with a big or strong technology component, the fact that IP and patents are the only registered data that is available and with all this information that is listed on the screen right now that is searchable and then be organized, it gives us that insight, that knowledge to enter the field, to enter, to, to sort and organize our search because we are limited in resources. We cannot do the extensive due diligence on every company that we cross paths with. So while the rest of the IP in the case of acquiring an established business is maybe even more important than the patent, the fact that we have all this information structured and available in the patent area, give us an entry point and give us a 
search and structured approach otherwise there's just too much of it there's just like you know so many of those companies out there where do you start so that's the what we've used um what i've used patent site for in the last um, few years months um focusing on identifying company so the next few slides are really uh I, it's a it's a real case and of an example of so of course we had to you know edit and and remove all the information that uh, could have allowed uh, you to identify which kind of technology or company we're talking about but the process is what i want to discuss here so with like with any kind of analytics the analysis that you're going to get is only as good as the data set that you're reviewing so the key aspect to start with is identifying a good data set the way i've done that is i start with a known target something that i know we are interested in some company that we already in talked with because their technology fits the bill fills the gap that we're trying to fill so i start with that i look at their recent year portfolio i look at it in a in a more you know um, engineering point of view, removing certain keywords because maybe they have two businesses or maybe their business has evolved over time and I need to do a bit of, uh, you know, cleaning around there. So I may remove certain keywords. Um, you know, patent side has those very uh, uh, useful Boolean functions and not, and not. And so you remove, you, you carve out, you clean out and you get the relevant portfolio of that company, which is what we do in the due diligence process anyway. Once I'm there, I try to kind of define the cluster in a bit broader sense. So one of the thing is I'm gonna extract uh, keywords because of course I have my engineering team and I talk with them, but the point is we are trying to acquire a company to fill a technological gap, which means I have nobody in my team to give me the exact knowledge about that technology, because otherwise I would need it to acquire. So I look at their portfolio and I shake it and I try to get some relevant keywords, okay? And all of that together with IPC classes, with the keywords of the portfolio analysis from that target gives me a definition of my technological or my technology cluster. So from that specific target, I then expand or I, I then dig into that specific target until I can define the technology that I'm looking for in patent keywords. And I do that already, you know, in the, in the we're here talking about patent site, I do that already in patent site. The next step is to validate, okay? So I'm looking at this, I'm like, well, I want to make sure I'm not completely out in the bush here. So I need to validate my cluster. So I look at it and say, okay, let's put that back in and let's put the companies that I know are operating in this space, does it match, okay? And here on the right side, you have the two indicators that I use the most often. On the top one is the portfolio size. While, you know, there is a lot of things to say about using not only the portfolio size, the portfolio size does, give an indication of how much money they invested behind that. I know from where I sit, we trim and review our portfolio every week or every month, and we only keep paying or we keep alive the things, the technology that we believe in. So I look at the portfolio size because it does tell me something about their, their investment strategy inside the company. And I also look at the technology relevance. So if you're not familiar with the patent set, different indicators, portfolio size, I think everybody uh, can understand, it's the number of inventions, but the technology relevance is a normalized indicator around the citation, how much a, a, a patent document has of an influence in the future of the, the technology. And that already, you know, looking at this from those both angles already give us something so first it allows me to to validate my technical technical cluster but also sometimes it will give me a bit of a changing of the priorities uh, why is this moving around all right so if you see in that example 
some companies that had a big quantity actually didn't have a lot of relevance. And then you have one company here that has a lot of relevance, but had a very little and very recent portfolio. Now, none of that is a final answer, but what this is useful for is to change the priority in which we're gonna allocate our resource for the due diligence because those resources are limited. But in that case, maybe that company is gonna get a second seat compared to that company, which wasn't initially being reviewed, but now we see that their technology is, you know, the talk of the, the talk of the moment. So we define the cluster, starting from a sample and digging into that. We validate that cluster, and in the process, we already shuffle a little bit the deck versus what we know. And the next step is to really enlarge the cluster. So once I validated my cluster, I remove the known company and I just throw this and say, who is out there? Who is operating in that space? Now, in our case, as I said, we're not a venture company, so we don't want to acquire a, a, a startup. I mean, if anybody is familiar with how a 100,000 people company operates, integration of a startup is bound to lead to a bit of cultural clash, okay? So we, we would probably, you know, swallow them and spit them out because it wouldn't work. So we need a company that is already familiar with bidding. We need a company that is already familiar with a certain uh, operating system, with a certain reporting, with a certain financial. So to do that, I have to, for example, remove the single inventors. I have to also add a portfolio size because a startup that will have two patents is great, but that's not what I'm looking for here. Another factor, which is very critical when we're talking of this, this is a tool to support the strategy on the merger and acquisition. Now you have to understand and you have to analyze your own strategy. In that case, we were looking at an acquisition in a specific region because budget, because the money was available, not worldwide, but for that region. So we looked at a certain geography, we looked at a certain size of portfolio and a certain type of company. And all of these are filters that you can put in patent sites and you shake it and you get some results out of that, okay? So, and that's again, um, um, practical example. So some of the companies here we had from the known companies, but you see here two companies that emerged and had patents that were increasing in, in, in relevance. And those are targets we didn't know about, companies that we had not heard about before. And in particular, one of them, because the way in that specific example I structured the query is that I was looking for not a company based in that region, but for inventors based in that region. And the difference is that it allowed me to identify that a company, a fairly large company that we already know, I was able to identify that they all of a sudden appeared on the map in that region. So they have a lab that we didn't know about before that was working in that area that is of interest to us in that region. And this search allowed me to identify that because one of these you know, curve going up is actually a large company, but because I've restricted saying, I want only the inventors from that region, I was able to see that emergence. And then this basically allowed us to you know, among the, the known players and the new players, based on the technology relevance, we identify and shuffle the targets. So we identify new targets, we shuffle the, the priorities for existing targets, and we identified new players, as well as what I call sub-entities within large player, which is that example of a lab um, within a, a large company, because you have those massive companies that operate in silos, and it's very hard to find a full view but actually with that, we were able to approach them. And even the people in the other regions, when we approached them, they didn't know that they had this R&D project going on in the region we were interested uh, for an acquisition. So this is 
a real life example where we start with, as, as we were discussing earlier, the IP is a lot broader than just the patent. And if you limit your view to just the patent, it's, it's too restrictive. You have to make it bigger than that because in real life, it is bigger than that. But the patents with the amount of structured public data gives us an entry point. Mm. And in that specific example, using a tool like Patent Site, where we can switch based on technology relevance, based on size, use all those kind of criteria, we can tailor that to match a search, which of course you have to have an understanding of your own search. You have to know what you're looking for because otherwise you're walking around in the dark room. So you have to have a good understanding of what you're looking for. And mixing all of that, we were able to use patent to save resources by not spending time on companies that we didn't want to, didn't fit the bill, identify companies that we had never thought of and review them and approach them and identify a partner. In that case, it wasn't an acquisition at the end of the project, it was a partnership because we ended up partnering with that other company with their lab and kind of creating a joint development project with them around to fill that technological gap that we have. And that's like a practical example of how we've used IP intelligence to discuss with the board each of those steps and of course, it's always you know, nice to have those charts and bring those to the board, but it's more important to understand what they mean and to be able to sit with the board members and translate what they want, whether it's the geography, the project, the technical gap into criteria for searching the patents and then feeding back companies, adding value by saying, there is those companies we haven't identified before or that company that everybody sounds very excited about because they have a great sales pitch, guess what? They don't own any technology. So what are we talking about here? Because maybe something here is a bit, uh, you know, we, we're saying stars and, and glitter, but there is no substance behind or they've been hiding it. But in any case, it's a question that we need to ask. So all of those are tools to raise and address the questions that we would have in the board when looking at an acquisition. And with that, that's pretty much, I think, my next slide. Yes, it was. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think I went a little bit faster than expected, but maybe that will leave us more time for questions. That's always the, uh, the best bit. Thank you ever, ever so much, Robin. Uh, that was extremely insightful, and it's so great to hear a, a practical application where it's had really significant um, uh, cost benefits and um, uh, you know saving effort, time and effort. So uh, marvelous. What, what, out of out of the entire exercise, what would you say was the most challenging aspect? The most challenging aspect was getting in the boardroom, and it still is a challenge. Not to say it's solved. Um, IP is often seen as an expert business that kind of lives on its own. Um, almost separate from the rest of the company. And, and very often, because we are experts in the field, we are not so good at communicating with people in other fields. And so, so many times I've seen presentation about IP starting by trying to educate the board about what is a filing date. I mean, if they were interested, they'll be patent attorneys by now. So <laughs> it's, not their, it's not their focus and you have to really try to adjust and be on point and not try to get it because we have an expert knowledge that we have a mission to educate the world about patents. Um, they, they've been working, you know, many, many boards have been working with looking at the patents from a chart at the end of the year where they say, oh, we have that many files, we have that much spent, everybody claps and we move on. So if patent was critical for their survival, they would have looked into it by now. So I think that was the, the biggest challenge. Um, I also saw, um, I'm sorry, I, I, Richard, I have a question that came in through a private chat. So um, somebody was asking me about the challenge I faced in educating the M&A team about IP data. In my experience, the M&A team was actually um, very eager to get the data. 
it was more about the IP team getting educated about what the MA is about. That was the challenge more than the other way around. And, and as I said, it still is a challenge. It still is an ongoing process. But MA has been working and they've been doing it very well with IP only in the due diligence phase. So it, the education was more for me to learn about their process and see how I could plug in and add value and bring something to them rather than the other way around. So that was the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is company that I have may have missed because they don't file patent application. Um, the existence of the portfolio wasn't a criteria for us to review it. As I said, it allowed us to sort through existing companies, but there are two companies that we rejected because initially they came in and say, oh, we have such strong technology and, and they pitched all their technology. And when we looked, they didn't have any patents. So we turned back to them and asked, and a lot of it was like under development, under development. We are, uh, yeah, it's being developed, it's being developed. And that went back to the fact that we are looking at an operating business. We're not looking at funding a startup. So that actually cut through the smoke of distinguishing, it allowed us to ask that question. It raised the question with the M&A team. It focused your due diligence on those companies on to whether or not they were operational or not. And as it turns out, they were not. So while the existence of IP wasn't what, with the, the absence of registered IP didn't lead to their rejection, it led to asking a hard question, which led to being, them being rejected from the process. Mm. With that, I've answered the question in the chat. I... Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, uh, we've also got a, another question on um, uh, how often do you find the patent data uh, ends up being inaccurate or out of date and misleading? So this is about data quality. <sighs> so overall, inaccurate, not so often. Misinterpreted very often. So I would say more than misleading, the, the problem is you do need to have somebody who understands what is a filing date to make sense of those charts. So the, cha the, the, the risk is feeding those charts and it's not shoot and forget. So if you use those charts or if you use something like patent site, uh, you know, indicator, uh, a competitive index as a shoot and forget, and that's a decision making tool, then I would find this a bit risky. For me, it's a tool to allocate resource, to prioritize resource. And you do need to have an understanding and a critical thinking to not be misled by the information. But inaccurate, I think overall, the data from the patent offices is fairly accurate. Um, you just have to be able to make sense of it. So, so we've got known knowns and known unknowns and then unknown unknowns, um, which, which is the most challenging. So you're going to have to repeat that. <laughs> I, I, I refer to Donald Trump's world. Um, there are many difficult things to identify. There are known unknowns. And uh, obviously, we, we know that there are limitations with this. Uh, in terms of data quality, but there are also things that we don't know, and uh, the unknown unknowns. Um, and, and I was just wondering um, uh, how you get around that, or, or as you say, do you just use it as a, a a support tool, an aid to making decisions? I use it only as support tool, and that echoes also. There is a new question that came, and it's like, how do we ensure that the target has done freedom to operate checks? Um, basically if you're waiting to check everything or if you want to have a full view or make sure that there is no risk, you're not going to do any business. Be if you want to do business, you're going to have to take some risk and you have to go out there. The advantage um, in, in dealing with operating companies is that if somebody was upset with what they're doing, they would have been sued most likely, which again helps, you know, if you're looking at a startup, it's, it's a completely new field, you don't know what we, you're getting into. In my example, we're looking at operating companies that have a certain business. So they're making a little bit of wave. They're 
they might be very local, they might be very ge geographically limited, but they are, they are having a bit of a footprint, which means that if they were annoying somebody, somebody would have sued them. <laughs> so that's how we try to deal with the unknown. Then, of course, when we look at it, we do additional freedom to operate. We do, but this is typically, the unknown is typically something that we have our own process to deal with. And that's something that we integrate in our in our analysis. That's how we deal with the unknown. Excellent. Thank you, thank you, Robin. Alex, there's a question for you. Um, uh, if if a startup is looking to be acquired, how would you recommend they adjust their filing strategy? Uh, the balance between sort of uh, overexposure and cost. I think it, it comes back to a case of depends. <laughs> it depends on what well, back to my, it's, it's a bit like the question we had earlier. It just depends on the business and the nature of what they're doing. I think, uh, I think, um, and the technology that they're, that they're playing in as well, in my mind. Yep. I mean, I've okay. seen a, and horror stories of companies that have invested in building up huge patent portfolios and then before they know it they can't afford to maintain them they have to let them go drop them into all sorts of awkward discussions and then and then you're into another whole discussion which is not for today around where those patents end up but um, but 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 it you know it, it's something that i think before you embark on that journey you need to be really clear about the comments on my slide actually investing in building up an ip position it's a long-term commitment it's not a short-term commitment you need to recognize that the costs once you start will keep coming as you're building up that portfolio and maintaining them and that of course leaves a footprint uh, behind which uh, other potential competitors can see if uh, if a company's getting into financial difficulty um so uh, which can be tells i think also it lends back to the point about keeping things secret and confidential and confidential I mean, uh, there's a lot of technology and, and tech being developed in, in new areas where people have got no idea what the final outcome is going to be. So there's a lot of stuff being kept under wraps um, in certain markets, in the pharma space particularly, where things, I would assume, are kept very secretive until they know they've got something that's going to fly. Yep. Because and there's cost impact on that journey. It's great. And another one for you, Alex, just come in. Um, uh, so what risks might there be when uh, acquiring a startup? And uh, what kind of due diligence should they carry out? Well, I, I think for me, um, one of the big risks that I've seen, certainly through my holidays of talking to companies, is when you look at acquiring a company, a lot of the risk tends to be wrapped up in around the assets associated with individuals and people and the movement of people i mean to me that's where i would be thinking the risk are because why what is it that you're buying the company for and why and i can think of a, several examples where we've looked at companies that have gone and bought startups you look at what they've bought why have they bought them it's predominantly because of the people or, or the, what the people are creating so you need to start looking at how well preserved how well protected they are and how secure those assets are that you're acquiring in my mind i think it's possibly to some extent it's less so about the patentable tech depending on what you're buying in the stage they're at and where that's at but it's there's a lot of stuff that goes on around how secure the people and the and, and the contracts and and the chain of command are that's great thank you alex and uh one more question given that you were in an ip valuation um consulting company previously uh what's the panel's experience uh of how companies are reflecting their ip value on its balance sheet so my response to that is that I think more and more companies are starting to explore that as a, as a way of identifying value. I think um, it's important to recognize that if you're looking to value your IP, it's not necessarily what the final number is. It's what are you using it for? And what I found is the companies that are using valuation successfully are using valuation as a negotiation tactic or a negotiation tool. Because when you build a, a model to put the value together, there are uh, any number of risks that dictate where the, the valuation is gonna fall at the end of the day. And depending on how you, how you ascribe those risks depends on whether the valuation could go up or down and by what factor. So you need to be really careful when you use valuation because in one context, it could have one number and in a different context, it could have a, a very different value. And that's why we speak to those in the valuation world. You, you value IP by future income models or cost bases or comparable models, a whole raft of stuff. It's, uh, it's, but that, that's, that's my sort of view of the world of valuation. 
do, does anyone have experience of valuing trade secrets? We, we, um, I can talk on, 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 on my side for the experience. The IP on the balance sheet is a cost, unless you're in a licensing company with licensing revenues. But if you're in a licensing company, then obviously it's a revenue. But in a manufacturing company, the IP is a cost and it's nothing else. You try to change points of view by adding information such as you know uh, quality indicators. But if you're strictly speaking of balance sheet it'd be, in a manufacturing company, it'd be a cost. And the trade secret, um, it's an interesting one because it is valued for a representation of certain knowledge. It is paid to inventors as a reward, so it is a cost. But the fact is that I have no knowledge of any company where trade secret would be big enough that it would make it into the balance sheet on its own. So for me, trade secret has always been an anecdotal case, an important one, but still anecdotal. Let's hope Coca-Cola are not listening. Um, so uh, on the, on another point, uh, Robin, thank you for that. Um, we've got a we've got a couple of questions. Uh, that come in on your analysis and use of value metrics. So um, in, how easy or difficult was it to explain these uh, metrics to internal stakeholders? It takes a lot of patience and it takes a lot of repetition. Uh, but ultimately, I found that everybody was very interested because it fits, fits it feels a need. Um, and it takes a bit of time to communicate around it, but it does feel it does fit a need, and there was a demand for it. Time will tell whether I did a good job in explaining it around. <laughs> well, time time always helps. Hey, um, the the other thing is, uh, if so, if you were um, a startup company. Uh, and Eaton was looking for a startup in in this space. Um, rather than a small established company, how might uh, they adjust uh, strategy uh, given the potential smaller number of patents that they would hold? So. I think in such cases, when you're looking really at startups or, or very small portfolio, data analytics don't work so well anymore. Data analytics includes a certain statistical effect. So if your sample that you're looking at is too small, relative positions don't mean anything and you need to review them one by one. So when we're looking, if you're looking at small companies and I was working uh, in my previous company doing that, we were sitting down with engineers for a full day and having them explain it. There was no way around it. It was going back to the IP that is the personal IP, the, what they have in their head, what they're talking about, and, and then researching that because the IP data is good as a statistical tool for me. But once your sample becomes too small, statistics don't mean anything. Excellent. Well, I think that's a good way to end. Uh, we've all got to be careful with the way that we interpret the data and uh, the results are only as good as uh, the data is. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you, Alex. Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, thank you, William, for hosting this. I know you've got a, a couple of uh, interesting things to follow up. Uh, yeah, so um, it's uh, interesting that, that, that Robin brings up the point of, um, you know, effectively interpreting the data that there isn't necessarily a data quality issue but there there can be a, a or a misleading issue it's an interpretation problem there so um something pattern site do um as a as a product is the, the services of the consulting team come with that and um, to support and then to help interpret the data or analysis that comes with that um we obviously include that in the product like i say but um we also plan a uh, a set of sessions as part of our academy program this is starting from the september 24th um one session per week obviously virtually in the current climate that we we have with uh, travel restrictions and such but um these will lead through from 
the beginning of, of why pattern information might be interesting for, um, say, competitive intelligence or, or other um, business areas, to uh, the theory behind pattern analytics, to the actual uh, acting out the analysis for particular topics such as M&A that we looked at today, or um, licensing, portfolio management, and, and such. Um, and those can be booked individually or, or as a whole set. And, and there's, of course, discounts for those multiple sets in there. So that's on a, uh, this innovationanalytics.com. The, the link's in the bottom right of the page there. And um, maybe on the next slide, there's uh, just a few notes of, of some of the other uh, content that's that's available from, from Patent Site in terms of uh, analyses on um, artificial intelligence or, or looking at, at small companies. Um, a posting from, from the weekend uh, in Forbes um, looking at uh, Zooks, the ac recent acquisition by uh, uh, Amazon, which might be interesting for people. So, um, yeah, there's a few bits of information about Patent Site there. Um, and I think um, Alex and, and Robin, it's a, a really nice analysis from, from both of you and, and leading us through to, um, to understand the, the value of uh, IP analytics. Pleasure to, to be with you guys. Wonderful. And th thank you for hosting and thank you for attending everyone that's online. Have a good day. Thank you very much, everybody.